I want to begin with a few statements that will protect your future. And the first statement I want to remind you of is this. If you face life casually, you will end up a casualty. You cannot face life casually. Secondly, there is no future for the unfaithful. If you are not faithful and committed, you will lose your future. And thirdly, life is a privilege, not a plague. Many people consider life to be such a difficult thing, but it's really a gift from God. It's a, it's a privilege to be given life, and we need to handle it very carefully. My heart is so full tonight because there's so much that I believe God wants to say to us that will change the way we think. And here's another thought to put away in your heart. No position in life places us above counsel. It doesn't matter how high you go, how famous you become, how rich you think you are, you are never above counsel. Everybody needs counsel. Another principle I've learned that helped me is this, that God positions us to influence others. He also positions us to change the course of events. And he positions us to protect his purpose. So one of the most important things you must do as a young person and as an adult is to discover your position in life. What were you born to do with your life? What is the position God had in mind for you? Another principle I want you to remember is this. Bad environments destroy good destinies. Nothing can destroy your destiny faster than the wrong environment. And we're about to leave one part of our lives and enter an unlived part. I want to remind you to check your environments. And finally, a quality choice makes for a permanent change. The only way for you to change is for you to make a quality choice. That is not as easy as it looks, but it must be done. With that in mind, let me talk a little bit about time. By the tape. Some of you are right too slow. All right, I'll give you a break. Time is what we're dealing with right now. We're about to lose a year and enter a new year. That's time. We're about to lose a past and enter a new present that promises a new future. Time is one of the greatest gifts God ever gave man. I thank God I live in time. The problem is God created time. He put us in it, but he doesn't live in it. God lives in eternity. But God put us in time because God wanted to protect us from eternity. Very important revelation that I had to understand. If you lived in eternity, you would not survive. You got to prepare to live in eternity. Because everything in eternity is forever. And God took us out of eternity so we could enjoy the benefit of time. Time is defined, in my view, as an interruption in eternity. It's a piece of eternity God put out, and he put an end and a beginning to it, and then he put us in it. So eternity has no end nor a beginning, and God interrupted eternity and pulled out a piece of it and called it time. And then he put us in that spot. So we can experience an end and a beginning for everything. Time allows us, therefore, to live life in what I call seasons, and it enables us to manage destiny in days. 
You don't have to live your life all at once. God allows you to live your life in days and in years and in months. We thank God for that privilege. Time provides opportunity to regulate choice and establish change. You can decide to do something different this new year than you did last year. Time allows you to make that kind of choice. So time is a benefit in the sense that we could always say, I used to do that last year. I don't do it anymore. If there wasn't any time, you couldn't say that. So whatever you were not doing last year that was not beneficial, you have to make a decision now to make sure you change your behavior to have a different experience. Another point that's important is that time allows us to divide our lives into three dimensions, past, present, and future. Thank God for these dimensions. In the past, I used to be a certain way. In the present, I am another way. In the future, I plan to be a different way. That's what time allows. Time allows us to divide our lives into three segments. And I'm happy with that because a lot of our past, we are glad our past. Can I hear an amen? There's some things in your past that you're so glad doesn't live with you now. Thank God for past. And then finally, time is our guarantee that nothing on earth will last forever. Praise the Lord. Now, some of you married folks probably will say that and give God thanks. <laughs> but God has given us time so that we can have a beginning and an end. And there are things that you've been going through that time will always deal with. Your pain, your frustration, your disappointments have an end. I was hurt last year, but I'm through it now. I got a divorce last year, but I'm over it now. I was abused 20 years ago, but I got over it now. See, time allows you to push things back away from you. And you can live a new life with a past that was not good. But thank God it's a past. But what I want to talk about brief, briefly is when was time created? And it's found in the book of Genesis chapter 1. And you want to make a note of this verse. This is when time was created. And God also tells us why. Let me read it for you. Genesis 1 verse 14 says, And God said, Let there be lights in the heavens, the expanse of the sky, to separate day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. So God created seasons, days, and years in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, by giving us lights in the sky. That's why we can measure days and night, which becomes months, which becomes years, which becomes decades, which becomes millennia. In other words, God's light gives us an exact measure as the sun rises and the sun sets, or as the world spins around the sun, whatever that does to us, the lights give us the measure capability to measure seasons. Summer, winter, autumn and spring, day and night. And so we are able to have seasons and days and times and years, God says, because of the years that he created in the light system. But I like verse 15. It says, And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth and it was good time is good God says time is good so we need to appreciate if time is good what's the purpose for time it's very easily discovered Ecclesiastes rather chapter 3 verse 1 says to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven so time was created for purpose Ecclesiastes chapter 3 rather verse 10 says I have set the, the burden, I have seen the burden God has laid on man. What is that burden? He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of all men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. Very important verse of scripture. Let me explain it to you in a simple way. The Bible says there's a burden God placed on all humans. And that burden is that he has designed everything to happen within a certain time. Which means that the minute you were born, you've got to quickly find out what you're supposed to do because it's been given a certain time to be done. 
and you've got to find it before you die. So the pressure and the burden is on you to find out your assignment to do it within the time you're supposed to have it done before you die. That's the pressure. But another point says, He has put eternity in our hearts, which means that God placed your beginning and your end in your present. When you were born, you were born with your beginning and your end on the inside. You are a walking destiny. Therefore, a couple of thoughts come out of this verse. Number one, time was given for purpose to be fulfilled. Number two, you don't have forever to fulfill your purpose. There's a season for everything. And number three, your purpose is God's established end for your beginning. And number four, seasons are natural. And the changes that they bring, they bring their own inherent blessings. Someone needs to hear this point. There's a season for everything. How many of you ever tried to pick a mango when it's not a season for ripeness, but a mango? You can actually pick a mango when it's green. A very small, hard, green fruit. You can, you can do it. The tree doesn't fight you. You can take it off. The problem is you will not be able to enjoy that experience if you try to eat that. You see, you can actually take things out of season, and no matter what you do, they will never work for you. Seasons bring their own inherent blessings, which means if you know that everything has a season for your life, then if you continue to study your seasons, everything works in your favor. When it's your season, even your enemies become your friends. When it's your season, every bank that told you no suddenly starts saying yes. When it's your season, people who didn't like you will start helping you and can't explain why. When it's your season, things that were so difficult become so easy. See, season has its own inherent blessings. So there are some things that you're supposed to do in 2005 that you try to do in 2004, and it was like hell on earth. But guess what? You're about to move into a season that is the time for that thing, and everything that was so difficult last year is going to be very easy this year, and things you have to fight for are not going to fight to come to you. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Something that is seasonal is about to come into your life, and it's going to be so easy, you're going to think it's a setup, and the answer is it is. It's your season. There's some things I'm supposed to have in 2005, and they cannot stay away from me. I'm talking about myself right now. I don't know, but you can talk to yourself. There's some things I'm supposed to get in 2005 that nothing can keep them from me. So I am open for whatever is seasonal in my life. That's because whatever you were born to do is already purposed. Let's talk about purpose and destiny very quickly. Proverbs 19.21 is my favorite verse of scripture. And it says, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is what? The Lord's purpose that will prevail. I like Psalm 57 verse 2. It says, I cry out to God, most high, the God who will fulfill his purpose for me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. I love this verse. God gave you birth, gave you a purpose for your birth, and then he commits himself to fulfill it for you. Then he says, if anyone try to stop you, he'll get them. You better clap hands for that verse. That's a powerful verse. Whatever you were born to do, God is going to protect you through developing it. And he will come from heaven to save you. In other words, heaven is on the side of God's purpose for your life. Now let's talk about how strong purpose is. Very important. Uh, Psalm 138 verse 8 says, The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Then it says, Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. In other words, God will never abandon what he gave you birth to do. And that's what I want to get to here. He will not abandon you, but the question is, will you abandon it? Will you abandon the purpose that God gave you birth to do? This is what the Holy Spirit spoke to me about tonight. He wants to make sure that you do not miss what he's already guaranteed for you to succeed in. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11, I love it. It says, 
in him we were also chosen, having been predestined, according to the plan of him who works out everything to conform to the purpose of his will. That's a powerful verse. A couple of points here in this verse. Number one, he says, you were chosen. God handpicked you before you was conceived to fulfill something for him. Secondly, it says you were predestined. In other words, he set your destination before he began you. He set your end before he started you. So you came into earth because there's something God already ended. You're supposed to begin. Your life is not an experiment. You are not a mistake. You are not a biological accident. There's something God already destined for you that made you come into this world. And then it says he will conform everything to his will. This is very important because when I read it some years ago, I forgot to study this verse with the word all. He works out everything, all things to conform to his purpose for your life. He didn't say he worked out all the good things or the right things. He works out what? Everything. That means if you make a mistake, God will use the mistake and turn it into a testimony and keep your purpose going. That means if you fail in something, whether it's a marriage or pregnancy or commitment to school or if you lost some kind of business you had, God still takes all of that and he conforms it. He brings it into the program to keep you on course. In other words, your mistakes are not more powerful than your purpose. No failure can stop God's destiny for your life. Only you can stop it. Very important to remember this verse 10. It says, I make known the end from the beginning, and from ancient times what is yet to come, I say my purpose will stand, and I will do what pleases me. God speaking Isaiah 46, and he makes it clear in verse 10. I make known, or I establish the end before the beginning, and I make known from ancient times what is yet to come. I say my purpose will stand. What God is saying is, he always begins with the end before he starts. It's a very important verse of scripture. He said the end before the beginning. That means when God begins something, that is proof that he's finished. God doesn't allow anything to start that's not already ended. God ends it first and then he begins it. And I remind myself of this to keep me encouraged. Matter of fact, the verse before this says, remember this. Take it to heart. Do not forget it. Why? If you forget that your end is already finished, you'll get discouraged on your way there. So you've got to keep reminding yourself. And I preach to myself quietly every day. I mean, when I'm by myself, I am constantly preaching my own revelation to me. My end is finished. I'm on my way there. And sometimes, ain't no one around to encourage you, you know. And boy, discouragement could come around fast from everybody else. You've got to encourage yourself in the Lord. And the Bible says, don't forget this revelation that he sets the end before the beginning. That means he didn't begin you until he finished you. So you are not an experiment again. You are a result looking for somewhere to happen. God is not worried about your future. It's his past. Your future is God's past. Write this statement down. Your destiny is established and finished. And you were born to begin your end. Your end is finished, but you were born to begin it. Therefore, there's something God already finished that you were born to start. And the fact that you exist is proof that there's something already ended that you were born to start. So the fact that he conceived you is proof that there's something already done that God wanted you to get started. You are at the beginning of your end right now. You are on the process of toward your end. And you have to stay on course. Now, I love what God says. Uh, God is still committed to your destiny. But my question is, are you? God will never cancel what he gave you birth to do. But the question is, have you been committed to it? God is always committed to what he gave you birth to do. But are you committed to it? And I'm asking this question because we're going to answer this in a few minutes. And you've got to answer it yourself, actually. Here's something to remember. You've got to choose your chosen destiny. Even though God chose your destiny, you've got to choose to choose it. Not because God gave you birth to do something great doesn't mean you're going to become great. You've got to choose what he chose. Why? Because there's a problem with humanity. I call it a problem. It's really a challenge. And that is, 
your destiny is established, but it's not guaranteed. It's like me paying for my son and daughter to go to college. I pay their tuition, but whether they graduate is up to them, not me. So my destiny for them is already established, and I'm paying the tuition. I see that they have a degree at the end. I've already seen their end. So I send them to the school because I see their end. They are graduates. They have a degree. So I see their end. But will they make it? It's not up to me. God is the same way. God has already established your end, but whether you make it there is up to you. God doesn't study for you or obey himself for you. You and I have a challenge. And the challenge is, here's the challenge, because man possesses a will, you have to choose your chosen destiny. You are not an animal that lives on instinct. You live on decisions. And even though God has a good plan for your life, he knows what he wants for you. And God has some things he wants you to accomplish in 2005. Whether you will do it is not up to God. That's why this night is so important and this message is so important because the Holy Spirit spoke to me and says, tell them to stay on course. I tell you, your destiny is determined by your decisions. Your destiny decides your course in life. It's a very important point to write down. Your destiny decides your course in life. Once you know where you're supposed to go in life, if you know what your dream is to become, that decides your course. Wherever you want to end up determines the route you choose, the practices that you incubate in your own life, the habits that you develop. Your course is chosen by your destiny. Now your choices determine your course. That's another complication. Your destiny decides your course, but then your choices determines the course that you are on. How many of you made plans last year? You made some resolutions. You got them on paper. You, you printed them up. They're in your computer. You got them on the wall and haven't done a one of them. You know why? Because even though you set your course, you didn't make the choices that was in keeping with your course. Making a plan is no guarantee you're going to succeed. It's the choices that keeps you on the course that will determine your destiny. Here's a question. Do you know what course you are on? This statement is very, very frightening to me. We all know the course we are on. That's a frightening statement. Everyone in this auditorium and everybody watching this television program listening to this tape listening to this CD I know that you know what course you are on you know exactly what you're doing you know exactly where you're headed if you begin to smoke you know your course is cancer if you just casually sip in your beer you know if you don't change your course you will end up being alcoholic you know if you sniffing around doing your little cocaine on the side, you know that you're telling your cousin you can end up on the streets. You know that. If you keep going to work late and getting the boss mad, you know your future. <laughs> In other words, we all know the course we are on. Getting up late, not exercising, and eating a lot of pork chop. You ain't got no revelation to know your future. Your future's already known by you. You know the course you're on. You feel that pain. You know it's time to exercise. And you keep finding 10 excuses why you wouldn't. You've chosen your course. You know the course you're on. If you are stealing money, just a little bit of money from the bank, every month for the last six months, you know your course. You know the course you're on. If you're lying about your relationships, if you are lying about things that you should not be doing, you know your course. We all know the course we're on. My question is, do you want to stay on that course this year? You've got to make decisions to get on the course that is in keeping with your destiny in God. Very important. Here are some questions of the course. 
These questions are important. I want to challenge you to write them down in the back of your Bible, find a blank page, and study these questions every single month of 2005. First question, do you know where you want to go? Second question, do you know what you want to achieve? Third question, do you know the desires of your own heart? Fourth question, did you set a course to take you to your dreams? Have you done it? Number five, are you still on course, on the course you set? Are you still on the course? Number six, is the course you are presently on taking you to your destiny? You know if it's going there or not. I can almost hear some of you last year, the same night, saying to yourself, I am going to lose 20 pounds. You wrote it down on the prayer card, put it on the altar, spoke in tongues over it, and went right out and ate ice cream. Is the course that you set the one you're still on? Number seven, are the things you are presently doing leading to your dream? Think about what you're doing. There's so much to think about, it takes time to think about it. Are the books you're reading taking you to your dream? Are the movies you're watching taking you to your dream? Is what you're doing in secret taking you to your dream? What course are you on? Number eight, have you been detoured or distracted from your course? What happened? What disrupted your life that took you off course the last 12 months? How come you were probably right where you were last year, haven't improved? You haven't developed, you haven't advanced in so many areas. Uh, what kept you off course? What took you off course? Last question. Are you satisfied with the course you are on? Are you satisfied? You've got to answer all these questions yourself. Because without an answer to these questions, you'll be the same old, same old. Every year, I always plan to be better than I was last year, to do something bigger than I did last year, to do more than I did last year, to keep my word to myself better than I did last year. I always try to do something that leaves an eternal mark than I did last year. A lot of people just keep doing the same things. They won't change their course. I'm glad you're here. Uh, there is a scripture I found in Isaiah 26. It says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is what? Stayed on me, God says, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the God, the Lord is the rock eternal. It's a very important verse of scripture. Keep your mind stayed on God and it says you will have peace. I want to talk about that from example of an experience that I had about being on a course. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you what? The desires of your heart, right? Yes. Okay. And Proverbs chapter 16 verse 9, I love it. It says, In his heart the man makes his plans, but the Lord directs the steps of it. Who makes the plans? The man does. Who directs the steps of it? God does. In other words, you make the plan, God directs you. Young people, if you don't have a plan, God has nothing to direct in your life. I wrote a plan when I was 13 years old for my life. I mean, I was a teenager, 13, and I wrote it on a dirty piece of paper. And everything I wrote on that paper, I'm doing still today. And that plan began to grow. It begins to expand. But you've got to start somewhere. And it was that plan that kept me of drugs, kept me away from smoking, kept me from drinking, and I was born in Bain Town in the heart of two liquor bars on life and left and right. How do you survive South Street with so many, the first gangs were in our area. I was born there, grew up there, because I had a plan. God could then direct me. Don't ask God to guide you if you don't know where you want to go. You've got to have a plan. 
My question is, why do you need to change your course? Here's some thoughts. First of all, I believe God designed and provides keys and laws to change and keep us on course. I'm sure they're built into God's plan. Number two, every new year allows us to review, renew, revise, and refocus our course. Hopefully you'll do that in the next few hours, that you will think about your life. Are you going the way you want to go? Are you becoming the woman and the man you want to be? Are you doing things that will develop you into the person you want to become? If you're not, you will not become it. Some of you may have been challenged by not reading the Bible this past year. So you don't know the word. But you've got to make a change in that course. And many of us have been neglecting prayer time with God. And we wonder why we are so spiritually weak. If you don't spend time with God, you won't get any spiritual energy. So you are being beaten by life and struggling and, and frustrated because you're not spending time with God in prayer. Whatever your course you're on is affecting your life and your experience. Number three, this year, take the courage to change your course. That's my challenge. 2005. Our former prime minister this week, this past week, was taken to the hospital. He drove himself to the hospital. You all know the story. And I was watching the news when they were interviewing him. And the reporter asked him, are you going to change your lifestyle? He didn't even wait for the finish of the sentence. He says, look, I want to live. <laughs> he said, I want to live. I want life. He said, therefore, I am going to stop smoking. And I'm going to exercise. Now, my question is, why does it take a crisis for you to change your course? Don't let crisis make you change your course. Let your choices change your course tonight. Decide, I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to be more spiritual. I'm going to stop wasting time. I'm going to use my time more effectively. I'm going to change the course of how I use my life. How many of your Bibles have been read last year? I'm talking about church-going, Sunday-sitting people. You've got to change your course. I am not supposed to read the Bible for you. I read the Bible and I chunk it. I mean chunks of it. Because it's my choice. I have to stay on course. If I want to know the word, I got to eat the word. Someone gets sick and all of a sudden they want all the tapes. Send me some tapes. Send me some scripture on tapes. Bring my Bible when you come. I, I, when I come out here, I go straight to prayer meeting, God. Why aren't you going to prayer meeting every Monday without crisis? Somehow we are, we, 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 we know the course we're on, but no one's telling us to be honest with ourselves. Let me give you some things to write down. At 12 o'clock. Let's pause for a minute. Bow your heads with me, please. Repeat this prayer. Dear Lord, many didn't make it. They died this week. But I thank you that 2005 is mine. I thank you for this moment. And I receive all the blessings, all the opportunities, and all the possibilities that are in 2005. I now step over into a new life. 2004 is my history. 2005 is my future. Thank you, Lord, for keeping me. I made it. Give him thanks. Let's give him praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I made it. One more year. One more year to do your will, Lord. One more year to do your will, Lord. 
Keep writing, please. Write this down. Readjusting your flight course. This is so important. Some of you may be aware that the Lord has been very good to us. And we've been privileged to fly our own aircraft. And this past year, we've been so educated having that honor. Because the pilots in our church who fly us, they taught me so much about flying. You know, when you drive those, fly those big jets, you don't learn hardly nothing. But when you are sitting constantly in the environment where these professionals are working, you learn so much. And I walked out of the aircraft this year understanding God more than anything else. And I found out some things, and I sat down with our pilots over and over again, and I just asked them questions. I'm very inquisitive. I saw all these buttons and all these dials and all this stuff in the cockpit, and I keep asking, I said, what is that? And what is that for? Why is that moving? Why isn't that moving? What's this light? And, and, they, and they would answer me these questions because I want to know. I want to know what makes this thing successful, what makes an aircraft fly. And I discovered some things about an aircraft that is exactly like God. And it's how we relate to God. The pilots told me these things I'm going to give you right now. Number one, the first thing the pilot says, you must decide your destination. You never leave the ground. They won't allow you to leave the ground without a destination. Can you imagine? You don't just take off from an airport. You have to know exactly where you're going to land before you leave. They will not allow you to take off. How many of us go into life, don't know where we want to end up? I'm going to say it again. No aircraft leaves the ground until the tower knows their destination. Number two, and this blew my mind, they must file their flight plan. Filing your flight plan means you must also submit to the authorities the route that you are going to take, the plan you have to get there before you leave the ground. And then number three, you must monitor your flight with the plan, with the constant communication with the tower. Every single second, the pilots are talking to the tower. Every second, they're talking to the tower. Matter of fact, the tower is talking to them. I consider God the tower. The Holy Spirit is the communicator. And you and I have left the ground. You are on your way to a new year. And 2005, December, is supposed to take you to a certain level in life. The question is, have you filed a flight plan? Do you know what you want to do this year and how you plan to do it? This one is so interesting. The pilot says, I must follow the instructions of the tower because the tower sees the total picture. My pilot said to me, he says, any given minute around you, in a five miles radius, there could be a thousand aircraft. You can't see them, but there are different levels all around you. And the, the tower sees all of them, and the tower knows where you are. The problem is you don't know where you are in the whole system of aircraft. So you have to depend on the tower, and everything they tell you to do, you must do, because they know where the other crafts are. You cannot see the other crafts, but the tower knows. God knows where every single situation is around you. You're going to have to stay close to God and follow his instructions every day because you don't know who you could collide into or what you could crash into. Sometimes God will tell you, hold steady, and you want to move. One time, Captain Thurston said to me, oh, no. I said, what happened? He says, uh, they want us to pull back. We've got to slow down. I said, man, we're late. He said, but the tower said we got to slow down. I said, but we're going to be late. He says, yeah, but the tower said. He said, you is my pastor, but that's my tower. 
I got to slow down. And after about 20 minutes, he says, they send a message, you can now speed up again. And he said, when we begin to speed up, all of a sudden he saw this big delta. <laughs> went past. He said, that's why they told you to slow down. <laughs> Sometimes God will tell you, hold it right there. But you're so impatient, he sees the big picture. God will tell you, don't marry this man. And I mean love is of disobeying God like crazy. God, you don't understand. I love this brother. After all, I'm 42 and I got to grab something. I, you know, God said, don't do this. Now watch this. God knows there's another brother about two miles away on a different latitude and he's the right one. But since you can't wait, you crash with this one. Bang! And you end up in a helicopter rather than a Boeing 747. <laughs> God have mercy on your soul. We got to follow instructions because the tower can see the total picture. Principle, next principle. No matter what the conditions, you got to stay on course. Things fall apart in your life. God says, keep believing. Everyone abandon you. God says, stay steady. You lose your house. God says, still believe. I mean, the very business God told you to open, it closes. God says, stay steady. Everything you thought was already yours, you lose. God says, stay steady. When the conditions change, you got to obey the last command he gave you. What did God tell you last year that you have re totally refused to do? I heard a statement in, in Nigeria when I was there last month. Uh, Bishop Ayedipu was preaching. He made a statement. I wrote that thing down. That thing. He says, he says we should never uh, be selective in, obe in, in obedience. Selective obedience. We decide what we'll obey. You can't do that when you're following God. You got to obey the tower, whatever it says. And I know the pilots sometimes they tell me, they said, well, they said that we got to go up another, you know, uh, 2,000 feet. I said, why? He said, I don't know. They said, we must go up. Altitude got to change, 2,000 feet. Then he said, okay. They said, we got to go down. We got to drop another 10,000 feet. I said, why? He said, I don't know. You just got to do it. In other words, they don't listen to anything except the tower. Do you listen to the Holy Spirit like that? Because the Holy Spirit knows you fire your fight plan with Him. And He knows how to get you to avoid every crash, every collision, every hurricane and storm up ahead. He knows where they are. They can see the whole weather system. God knows where all the potholes are. He knows where all the demonic traps are. And God says, now, drop ten miles. And you go, well, God, I don't see nothing. It looks good out there. God says, just drop right now. Drop this friend now. Yeah, but God, we went to school together. Drop this friend now. Yeah, but Lord, you know, we go way back. Drop her now. God's trying to save your life. Sometimes you just know it's time to leave the group. They're getting into stuff that you ain't trained to be in, and it's time to leave, and you're still trying to be nice because you want to be approved by them. And you feel the Holy Spirit saying, change course now. Tell them you can't come back here no more. Amen. Because he sees the big picture. Amen. How many people have lost their future through a friend? I believe that everyone today who is struggling with habits that are destructive was encouraged by friends to start it. What are you doing right now? I've taken you off course. Write this one down, please. Submission to the directions of the tower protects your life and the life of others. When that aircraft obeys the tower, it protects itself and the other aircraft. How many people have been destroyed by your disobedience? 
I wonder how many people have lost their future because you were not in the right place at the right time when you're supposed to be there. And how many folks have lost their future because you were in the wrong place, you weren't supposed to be with them. It's important to stay on course, protect you. This last one is interesting. Never take instructions from other pilots, only from the tower. You know, Captain Thurston, when we fly in, sometimes he would, he would switch, he would, he would switch the fuel frequency, and he says, let's listen in. And he would switch the frequency, and we could hear, you know, uh, Delta pilots talking, we could hear, you know, American Airlines pilot talking, we could hear all these pilots, and they talking to each other, and everyone talking, talking, talking. And then he switched back, he said, let me keep it on the tower. And then a few times he would switch, and he would hear the pilots up ahead say, uh, there's some thunderstorms up ahead. It's bumpy up here. Another pilot would say, yeah, at 20,000 feet, it's bumpy. The guy said, yeah, at 40,000 feet, we got thunderstorms. But we don't change course. Even though they are telling us what's up ahead, we cannot obey them. The tower controls everything. Who do you listen to? Who has taken you off course? You were doing so well last, Je last December. When you were shutting down, you were starting a new year. And man, look at you. You are off course. You are still not accomplishing the things you wanted. Why? Because you listened to other pilots. They tell you what they see. Boy, you got to be careful when you listen to what people's experiences are. Because people's experiences is not God's will for you. I'm going to say it again. People's experiences are not God's will for you. God's word is your only authority, not people's experiences. And they will tell you what they've been through, how tough it was for them, and how they, you know, how they went through this. You listen to them and nod your head, but tell them, yeah, but I got to listen to the voice of God. Because God will not do for me what he did for you. Amen. I've heard people say that for many years, and if he did it for me, he did it for you. That ain't true. That ain't in the Bible. That's what people quote. God told Mo, uh, Joshua, I will be with you just like I was with Moses. And when you read Joshua, God ain't never done anything with Joshua the way he did it with Moses. Everything was different. So what the Lord did for you, he ain't going to do for me. He can do better. Amen. amen. I say amen. amen. He can do greater than what he did for you, for me. I believe that. He can do it differently. Because he knows the full picture. Here's why you should change your course. I found this wonderful scripture. It's a beautiful scripture. Proverbs 14 verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right unto a pilot. But the end thereof is a crash collision. You know, you know the course you're on. And you know what 2004 brought you. And you can see that you are not spiritually mature the way you should be. You don't know the books of the Bible that you never read. You haven't been praying the way you should. You haven't been reading the books that you bought. And you're wondering why there's no growth. Well, it's because you were going a certain way. And there's a way that seemed right. You can predict your end by the way you are going. If you want to be an exceptional person, you must do exceptional things. If you want to be an extraordinary person, you cannot do ordinary things. If you want to be an, a, an abnormal person, you can't do normal things. There's a way that seems right. You don't get away from nothing. Sometimes you think, well, I can outsmart God. You know, uh, I'm doing this, but, but you know, it's still working. It ain't working. It's like putting orange juice in your gas tank. You put it there right now, your car will still run. It'll start and everything. Am I right, Brother Paul? You put gasoline, you put orange juice in your gas tank right now, it, it'll run. It'll run for a while until that juice hits that carburetor. A lot of you have been drifting on grace 2004. And if you keep doing what you've been doing, that juice is going to hit your carburetor in 2005. And your life is going to go up in smoke because you think you got away. You didn't get away. 
It just ain't hit yet. God has sent me to tell you, change your course now. In the first hour of 2005, change the course of your life now. I got a feeling that some of you won't make it to the end of 2005 if you don't change your course. God will kill you to save your life. That's in the Bible. Don't look at me funny. The Bible says he will, he will turn them over to Satan to save their souls. Change your course. Here's a verse I thought was very beautiful. Psalm 119, verse 56. It says, I have considered my ways and I have turned my steps to your statutes. I've changed my course, David says. I considered my ways and I changed my course. God is telling you to look at what you're doing. Where are you going? Are you satisfied? Change your ways. I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. I will what? Hasten. He said, change fast. You need to shock your family when you go home. And tell them from now on, I'm reading the Bible every morning for two hours. Don't bother me. That's a shock to the system. Who you think you are? That's okay. I know where I want to end up, and this is the course I must take. The reason to change your course. Here's a couple of reasons I got. Why should you change your course? Number one, because you missed your destination last year. You didn't go or achieve what you wanted to achieve. You got to change your course. Number two, news of pending storms make you change your course. You see something coming that's not helpful to you, so you got to change your course. You know that what you're doing is going to create certain things, you got to change your course. Some of us have gotten into debt, financial debt, so badly because we didn't change our course last year. And now we are entering a new year with a whole lot of debt. And the problem is, we're going to still be doing the same things that got us into debt. God says, change your course now. Number three, number four rather, obstacles is why you should change your course. You know, you keep saying that the thing you're doing is causing you problems, and you keep doing it, and it keeps creating problems, you keep doing it. You've got to change your course. You've got rocks in the way, and you've got turbulence. You know that you've got to change your course. This, this ain't working. Number five, you change your course because you don't want to collide into people. Wrong company. Being in the wrong place all the time. Young people, change the folks you hang out with in 2005. Because some of the friends that you've been calling friends are really your enemies. Because they are encouraging you to do things that are destructive and will short circuit your vision and your purpose in life. You have to watch the collisions in your life. And some of us are on a collision course. We are, we're beginning to, to, to hang out with people who will eventually corrupt our manners. Sometimes we're on a collision course with destruction because of our behavior. Or maybe our attitudes. Or maybe some of the habits we got involved in. Change your course. Number six. You change your course to avoid friction. I was talking to a young man yesterday. And I said, how you doing? He says, fine. I said, are you married yet? He said, no. He said, I want to get married. I said, well, why aren't you married? He says, uh, you know, we, we've been engaged for a while. He said, but we keep fighting. So I, I saw in his face he wanted to talk a little bit. So I said, oh. I said, well, tell me about it. I said, what, what's the problem? He said, well, you know, every, I mean, just every time we, you know, we think things are working, then we have a big fight. We've been fighting for 12 months. I said, oh. So I gave him some advice. I said, let me, let, me, let me give you some advice, okay? I said, every relationship has problems. All relationships will have conflict. Conflicts are normal. I said, what you want to do before you get married, if you keep having fights, don't study the fights. Study the source of the fights. He said, what do you mean? I said, let me explain. I said, look, if you keep having conflicts because she's jealous, if you are with a young woman or something, or in your job, what you do, and she fights and she gets upset every time she sees with a woman, she gets mad. I said, now, the source of that is jealousy. Now, your work requires that you be with many people. And if she can't handle that now, see, the source tells you the future. I said, now, you know, 
if, if she all, you're always fighting because, you know, she thinks that you ain't giving her enough money or you ain't buying her good stuff, whatever, if that's a source of the fuss, you got problems. Because it means now that you got to have plenty of money all the time. <laughs> What's she going to do when you lose your job? See, the source tells you the cause. <laughs> I like what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs 31. You know, you women like to read that, eh? Proverbs 31, woman. But there's a verse tucked away in that chapter that you keep... You need, you need to get a revelation on that. That's a deep revelation. It says, her husband sits in the gate, and he has no need for spoil. Let me tell you what that means. She don't put pressure on him to go get anything for her. He don't go robbing and stealing to bring her things. Proverbs 31 woman. All he could afford is a plastic ring. So you enjoy it. <laughs> I don't want that. I want gold. Wait, wait, wait. The brother is at the plastic stage right now. You know, appreciate the plastic bag. You're causing problems. But I don't want that. What do you mean you don't want that? Sometimes you can't buy a ring until you've been married 20 years. I don't want a real ring. You got to be careful to avoid friction. You got to change your course. You know this, this relationship ain't going to work. You keep patching up every time, patching up, every patching, patch, and then repatching the patch, and then patching the patch that you repatch, and you still think, but you can get married. You better check this out. You're very frustrated by yourself. Don't have double frustration. Change your course. And some folks ain't willing to change to get you, they won't be willing to change to keep you. Yeah, but I believe the Lord can change him. The Lord tried to change him a long time. He can't change. He felt ready to change. You know, but she, you know, she, she, she's a, she, she can get better. She will. How long have you been going together? 20 years. What do you mean? You ain't married yet and you, did she get problems for 20 years? You need prayer. You change your course to avoid friction. Number seven, change your altitude and your latitude. That's why you change your course. Sometimes you've got to change the position that you are in. God may, may take you from a top position in the job to a lowly new, new job position. Can you adjust to that latitude and that altitude? Have a good attitude in the midst of it. You've got to change your course sometime in order for your great breakthrough to come. I know Joseph went to prison before he became a prince. So important that you be in a good attitude while you're in prison. That altitude is good because you need to check your attitude. When you come out and you achieve what God wants, you have the good attitude because you know what it is to suffer nothing, how to have live with nothing. The reason why you change your course is to follow the detours. You know, I, uh, I, it's incredible. Detours are amazing to me. I learned a lesson about detours. Detours do not mean to go back, to go backward. When you meet a detour, it simply means that you will still go to your course, to your destination, but you can take a different route. So I didn't plan on getting pregnant. God said, no problem. It's a detour. Keep moving towards your goal. I didn't plan to have a miscarriage. God said, that's okay. Stay on course. I didn't plan to get a divorce. Again. God says, that's okay. Stay on course. I didn't plan for my baby to die. God said, that's okay. Keep your vision. Stay on course. I didn't plan to be broke like this. That's okay. Stay on course. Every failure is a testimony of your future. God's going to turn that thing around. You're going to be able to talk about it. It's going to be the best thing you ever learned from. Whatever you're going through now, you are going through it. I guarantee it in Jesus' name. And you're going to come out better than you went in. Stay on course. Number nine, unexpected disruptions. Sometimes you change your course because you didn't expect things to happen the way they happen. You don't give up. 
You've got to adjust the course, but keep your destination. And then number 10, sometimes your timing is off. And sometimes you're off your season. You've got to change your course. It ain't time for certain things yet. And you've got to be willing to adjust yourself to change the course of your life. And let me give you why we need to leave our, co our course. Here's why we leave our course sometimes. I wrote this down. Number one, change priorities. We lose our course sometimes because we've changed our priorities. Instead of loving God, we fall in love with things. You were doing so fine, never missed a church service. Now you got two jobs, or got a business. We don't see you anymore. Your priorities change. You got to check that in 2005. Because when you start replacing God for other things, you're getting in trouble with your future. Number three, misplaced focus and values will make you change your course. What do you value all of a sudden that makes you a different person? Do you value being famous? Do you value running after money? Do you value trying to be a, a success in your business? Do you value trying to be famous in your, in your, in your ministry at the expense of relationship with God? Got to stay on course, eh? The third reason why we get off course is we lack personal time with God. You, you, you used to be with God every day, remember? You used to get up at 6 o'clock and spend two hours with God every morning. What happened? You're off course. Because you found more important things to do than God. You used to be faithful to church. But now you come to church when you are not tired. But what made you tired? My job. Who gave you that job? Number four. We leave our course because we lack time in the Word. When you lose love for God's word, you lose love for God. And when you lose love for God, your whole world changes. Because you start loving people and things instead of God. And they become your God. And all of a sudden your life becomes so misrepresenting of God that God begins to literally walk away from you. The Bible says that if you seek God, you'll find him. Which means if you don't seek him, he'll hide himself from you. Many times it takes us crisis to come back to God. Very sad. Number five, we leave our course because work replaces worship. I consciously, constantly, all, you see, as a pastor sometimes, you've got to understand, pastors get the biggest temptation to leave God. Because we're always with God. Sometimes we want to break from God. And we can have all kinds of things to distract us. But my personal time with God is my most important time in my life. And it's been 37 years now, and I've been enjoying God, because it's a choice I make every day. Don't let your work become more important than worship. Check your value this new year. Check your pursuit. Don't pursue things at the expense of God. Number six, we leave our course because we change our associations. You know, all of a sudden, you, you just miss people. You ever had a problem? You just miss them? I don't see them anymore. Because they change their associations, and their associations have become more important than their relationships that are spiritual. Very important to check your course right now. And then number seven, we change our course because of familiarity and abuse of God's grace. We become so familiar with God, oh, I don't need to go to church. I know what they can do. I know what they can do. I know how long it will be. See, you're so familiar with God, you're not even interested in God anymore. Oh, I know the Bible. Do you really know the Bible? What's in Habakkuk 5? What's in Zephaniah 2? What's in Agiah 4? You don't know the Bible. You know John 3.16, that's all you know. <laughs> Too familiar with God, and we begin to go off course. And so we, we abuse His grace. We sin, ask forgiveness. Sin, ask forgiveness. Sin, ask forgiveness. No wonder why we are off course. We are using God, not obeying God. You don't use God. You obey God. You love God. Number eight, we go off course because of personal relationships. Write this one in bold letters, please. I mean, you used to be so close to God, all of a sudden you got a boyfriend. And the boyfriend don't want to come to church. 
So you go on off course now. You were just becoming one of God's favorite, like Mary. He was going to use you to bless the world. And now you got a boyfriend that took you off course. You can't even get back. When your job or your relationship become more important than God, you got yourself on the wrong course. You off course. You got to fix that tonight in the name of Jesus. Fix it tonight. If they don't want to worship with you, they don't deserve to be with you. Some of your professional associations, check them out, please. What are they leading you into? Well, you know, it comes with the job. Yeah, but what, what are they leading you into? You got to set some standards that restrict your, your compromising your faith. You don't sacrifice your faith for finances or for fellowship with ungodly people. The Bible says, walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way that sinners stand. And don't sit in the seat with them when they scorn and scoff at God. Check your relationships so they can take you off course. Man, she's a fine looking girl. She's a fine woman. I like that fella. Yeah, ain't no, ain't no, ain't no man in church. Yeah, I, I find one. He don't go to church yet, but I find one. And I've been waiting a long time, and I can keep this one. I can grab this while it's hot. I gone. See, let me see you again. You pregnant and half cut. It ain't funny. Stories happen all the time in this life of this church. So where you been? I married. Really? Yeah. I've been married for five years. What? How come you never came to me as your pastor? Silence. Why? Because what they found, they themselves were ashamed to bring it to me. Change your course. There are some relationships that you need to check and change right away because some of them are leading you out of your marriage. Got to be cautious. Check those relationships. They can take you off course. Write this down, please. We leave our course because of entertainment, replacing our personal growth. This is so serious. People will spend hundreds of dollars on CDs that are not helpful to them. And they wouldn't buy anything to make them grow. Our entertainment has become more important than our growth. So we spend all kind of money to go to a club or go to a movie, but spend no money to listen to tapes that teach us the principles of God. Entertainment can take us off course. But God has brought us to this night. I call it halftime. Everybody say halftime. You know, in every football game, basketball game, soccer game, they have what they call halftime. Halftime is when the coach, uh, allowed by, the, by the, the, the game management to take time off in the middle of a game, and they spend halftime in the, in the, in the, what you call that place? In the locker room, yeah, locker room, right. You almost forgot, locker room. And they take the team back. Now, if the team was not doing good, like how maybe he wasn't doing good last year, then t tonight is your locker room night. You go back to the locker room, and the coach begins to talk to you. God is using me as a coach tonight, and Holy Ghost is right there as your counsel. And you listen to him right now. He's talking to you right now, wherever you are. And he's telling you, now look, you ain't doing too well out there last year. Last year, you, you lost a lot of points. You, you, you about to lose this game. I'll tell you what to do. You need to change your play. Change your attitude out there. Change the things you're doing. Don't do that anymore. Don't do that anymore. Change this. Change. And they go through the whole thing and they change the whole play. And when the players come back out, they're a different team. And the score changes. This is halftime. And God is telling all of us, change your play. 
you're going to go where you want to go, you've got to change what you're doing. If you keep doing what you're doing, you've got the same results that you've been getting. I beg you in the name of Jesus Christ, let tonight be the night that you change your course for the sake of your own safety. Time allows us to have half time. I call them timeouts, eh? Ephesians chapter 5 and 15 says, Be careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Now when you turn 50, that becomes more important to you. That verse right there. Because you ain't got no more time to experiment with people. I made a decision last year. And that decision is a serious decision. This year is going to maximize that decision in my life. And that is every appointment and every opportunity that have to be connected to my purpose and God's will for my life. So, if people want to waste time, I have no room. If you want to change, I will help you. If you want to improve, I will dedicate my time to you. But if you just want someone to pass the time with, you've got to find someone else. He says, take the most out of every opportunity. That's in the Bible. Maximize 2005 like you've never done a year before. Make every day count. And it says, do not be drunk with wine. Don't allow abscess and excess and abuse to take away your time. By the way, it takes time to sin, so stop making time for it. Use your time effectively. I want to close with these 10 simple keys to changing your course. And write them down, please. And these are the heart of tonight. Number one, if you want to change your course, the first thing you must do, you got to review, and then you have to revise and reset your vision. Go back and take a look at what you want to become. What did you want to do with your life? What do you want to do with your life? You got to stay on course. You got to review and revise your vision. Number two, uh, uh, you have to assess your obstacles. Study the things that you got to overcome to achieve your goals. Study them. List them. What do I need to, 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 to do to overcome these obstacles? What are these obstacles? If you want to lose 20 pounds, you know your obstacles, right? <laughs> you know the things you like. And every time you see them, you got spasms. So you need to know what you need to do. This is an obstacle. You have a Grammy or a grandmother or a mother who always cooking you the stuff and bringing it to you. You tell your Grammy, and I'll tell you what, uh, this year, I, I, uh, I fast in that for a year. Bring me fruit. Your obstacles. Then number three, study the failures of others. If you are going to stay on course, you got to let other people's example teach you. You saw what they did and they failed. You saw what they did and how it destroyed their lives. Why are you going to keep doing the same thing? You think you're different from they are? Impossible. Number four, review and revise and recommit to good counsel. This is very important. If you're going to stay on course, you've got to check the people who you are allowing to be your counselors. If you keep getting the same advice, you're going to get the same results. So who are you listening to? Who are your counsel? And number five, recognize the distractions and the enemies in your life. And sometimes it might be things or there might be people. Who is the distraction that takes you off course? To change your life, you've got to change the things that are distracting you. What is distracting you? I have a little note here. Make a public commitment and obtain accountable relationships to stay on course. What I mean by that is, uh, tonight, you might want to start it tonight. Find someone who you pray with tonight and say, look, here, I'm going to give you my plan for the year on paper. I'll give it to you. I want you to make sure I keep it. In other words, commit to someone to be your coach on your accountable relationship. They can check on you. Are you doing this? Are you doing this? There are people who have been trying to help, and I say to them, you told me you're going to do this. Are you doing it? And I'd call them, are you doing this? And I keep praying. Why? They made me an accountable relationship. 
you know, Brother Terry Nelson called me tonight. Uh, he has me as one of his, you know, account relationships. And I have him as one of mine, too. And he said, he said, you told me you were going to write three books for a year. Did you get them done? I said, I got four. I said, you said you're going to write one. Did you get it done? He said, no. Shut up. I said, okay, Papa, use Papa. But he didn't get his done. And I kept prodding him every phone call, twice a month. Are you working on it? Are you doing it? But you told me. They are important relationships. Get some relationships that become accountable to your own success. Let people commit to making sure you are faithful to yourself. Because we all need help. We need encouragement. Number six, acknowledge the dangers of collisions. If you're going to stay on course and change your life, you've got to acknowledge the truth about where you're headed. This is not going to help me. If I keep doing this, if I keep drinking this, if I keep, you know, having this practice, or if I keep this habit, it's going to destroy me. Acknowledge the dangers of collision. And number six, discontinue hazardous relationships and habits. Think about the relationships you have that are going to interfere with your future. And discontinue them. You might need to cut off some people. You might need to cut off some, some activities tonight in the name of Jesus. To make it to your destiny, you must cut off relationships that are hazardous. And number eight, change the environment that will hinder your progress and take you off course. The books you read, the entertainment that you choose to take up your time, uh, the friendships that you consume your life with, the habits that you are involved in, even the private ones, the secret ones, are they really going to help you get where you want to go? You've got to change them. A young man was sharing in the conference in November. I got his name, and I've been emailing him from then. He stood up to share, and he said, he said, when I read Dr. Monroe's book on potential. I decided I want to maximize my potential. He said he went to the bookstore and he bought every book of mine. He bought all the tapes that were available in the bookstore. It in, 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 uh, I think it was in Chicago somewhere, Detroit, Chicago. And he said he spent 380 odd dollars on all my material. He said he wanted to know everything I knew because he wanted to see and be what he saw in me. I said, my goodness, my members haven't done that. This fellow's given a report. He owns his own company. He has one of the most successful investment firms in Chicago. This guy was telling me how his business was growing and expanding. He wrote a big check to the ministry, put it in the offering. I say I stay in touch with this young man because his passion for knowledge attracted me. He was willing to invest in his own growth. That's what I call changing his environment. He said, I could quote everything you say on your tapes, because all the way to work every day, that's all I hear in my car all morning. He drives to work hour and a half. Imagine hour and a half of Miles Monroe every morning for two years. He's smarter than me. Because now he knows what I know, plus he knows what he knows. I don't know what he knows, so he's smarter than me. See, he's a wise man. Now he's a wealthy man, had a life that's on course. He knows what he wants to do because he changed his environment. To stay on course, you've got to change your environment. And number nine, you must look for the detours of God. The Bible says he'll make a way of escape. If you're going to change your life, this year, you got to take the escape routes that God shows you. When temptation comes, the Lord will always give you a way out. This year, decide to take them. God will say, leave now, or don't call, or don't answer the phone, or don't go to that particular event. He'll give you ways of escape. This year, decide, I'm going to take them. 
I'm going to stay on course. And finally, identify your season and stay in your season. You need to know where you're at in your life and then enjoy that period. Don't try to be something you're not yet. Enjoy where you are right now. Capitalize on the experience of your development. Know where you are in your season. Don't push it. Don't force it. Enjoy where God has placed you. As Corey Ten Boom would say, grow where you planted. Bring forth fruit right where you are. Because if you don't stay where you are supposed to be, you will be where you're not supposed to be. This, this is the night that you need to make some decisions, and I wrote down some decisions for you to make. You've got to choose the right course. Your destination dictates your course. Your course determines your destination. And every course leads to a destination, even the one you're on. The question is, do you want to go where it's taking you? Only you can change your course. And I had to figure that out years ago. Only me can decide what I become. Get your course according to your dream. Set it to where you want to go this year. Set your course according to where you want to become or what you want to become this year. Choose choices according to your courses. Whatever course you are wanting to be on, make sure the choices are related to that course. Your destiny was chosen by God. The course you choose determines your fulfillment of it. God doesn't choose your course, but he chose your destination. I, I hope that next year, this same time, there will be a lot of reports in this room that you made it to where you wanted to make it, that you were on course all year, and you had the right people in your life to keep you there. Philippians 3.12 says, No, nah, not I've not, not already obtained everything I want to do, Paul says, but I press to hold to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. There's a reason why God saved you, and Paul says you've got to find out what that is and press toward that. Verse 13 says, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I'm straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the mark of the higher calling, which is in heaven, wood, in Christ Jesus. You've got to forget, and then you've got to press. Maybe you're not happy with what happens in, happened in 2004, but that's okay. Let's forget that. Now we got a new start. we got a new opportunity. Amen? And staying on course means that the greatest temptation I've ever discovered on any course is impatience and discouragement. You've got to be careful with impatience. Do not be deceived. Galatians 6 verse 7. God cannot be mocked. A man will reap whatever he sows. Guaranteed. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Whatever you sow, you will reap. I like this last part, verse 9. Read it for me out loud, please. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Stay on course. Don't let the ship drift. Keep it on course. Don't let the compass be thrown out. Tonight, pick your compass up again and find your bearing and say, this is where I want to go this year. This is what I want to do this year. This is what I want to accomplish this year. Hebrews 12, I love it. Verse 12, it says, I therefore... Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out in front of us. What an encouragement. Verse 2 says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, and the scorn that came with him, the shame, and now he is sat down by the right hand of God, at the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The struggles you're going through, he's telling us, stay on course. I know what it means 
to stay on course. I want to show this, this, this photograph in your head. You ever seen a boat on the water? Can't go nowhere, hey? God is telling you to get back in the water. Get back in the boat and start again. Why? Never neglect the responsibility for setting your course. Don't do it. Let tonight be the night you decide, I am going to change my life. I'm going to make different kind of results this year. If you are on course, then I want you to keep doing what you're doing. If you're not on course, you need to change. You need to get back on course. Because everything that you do, God will keep you if you commit to him. God only keeps what you commit to him. God only keeps what you commit to him. God only keeps what you commit to him. This year, at this moment, God is saying to you young men and women, adults, he's saying, commit to me a new course, and I'll keep it for you. I'll help you keep it. On this first day of the year, it's the first day of a new opportunity. You must make this year the year that you will take the steps to take you to your course. No one can make decisions for you. You got to do it for yourself. So go back to personal prayer with time with God. Get back to daily reading of scripture. Get back to corporate fellowship. Get back to serving the body of Christ. Get back to witnessing to others. Get back to caring for your fellow saints. Get back to reading books that help you grow. Get back to working because you love work, not because you're getting paid. Get back to memorizing the word. You got to get back on course. And that list is on tape. Please get this tape. Choose your course. You will never change or achieve your best until you become restless and angry. Are you angry with where you're headed? I found out something. That you got to be discontented before you change. And that's what makes me change. I constantly am restless. I could do better. I could do more. I could do something new. I could do more. I could produce more. I keep making myself discontented. Never satisfy. Why? Because you will never change what you can tolerate. And here's something I thought was very interesting. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. He says, you will never change what you accept. If you accept this is where it is for you, you will never change it. Do not accept mediocrity for your life at all. My theme this year for this ministry is a simple theme. God says, tell everybody to stay on course. If you stay on course, you can expand the kingdom. And that's our focus. If we're going to impact the world, we're going to have to stay on course. We've got to keep doing what God told us to do. Don't let nothing distract what God told you to do. Stay on course. My prayer is that 2005 become the year that you experience the best you've ever done in your life. It is my prayer that you will stay on course and expand the kingdom of God through your life and that you will use your gifts to be a blessing to the world. This is my prayer. May everything you touch prosper. And may the devil be nervous every morning you wake up. May you cause every work of the devil to be destroyed this year. And may the works of the kingdom be established through you. May every plan Satan had for you become a trap for him. May everything that was destined to frustrate you fall to the ground and be made ashamed. May this be the most successful year of your life so far on earth, in Jesus' name. May 2005 be the wealthiest, richest, happiest year you've ever had, in Jesus' name. May every frustration you had in 2004 leave you right now, in the name of Jesus. May you walk in the newness of life that was intended for you from the beginning. May everything that God promised you in 2004 that didn't come to pass begin to come to pass tonight and this year see its fulfillment in Jesus' name.
May every disease that you had in 2004 be history in 2004. May your disease be left in that year. May you live in health for the entire year in Jesus' mighty name. Do you receive that? Lift your hands and receive it right now. May every bill you've been struggling with become paid in full in 2005. May this year become the year that debt free becomes normal for you in the name of Jesus. May it be the year that everything you've been struggling with in relationships be resolved in the first six months, totally forever in Jesus' name. I decree that every business that have been tampering and struggling and, and, and shagging will twist and turn into God's will right now in the name of Jesus. May every cancer that was eating at you, whether it is physical or financial, may it be destroyed by the power of God right now in Jesus' name. I declare that every promise God made to you will come to pass in 2005 in the season of its time. May every enemy that's been raised up against you in 2004 be made ashamed in 2005. And may you become a spectacle of joy. May your joy be so full they become jealous of your joy in the name of Jesus. May your freedom be so full that they will know you are called by the name of the Lord. May there be no obstacles you cannot overcome in 2005. May your life become a testimony of God's goodness in 2005. I decree that every word of God that he spoke to you from the word will...